Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Jared Harshman again, a PhD candidate at Oklahoma State University. So if you didn't see the first episode with Jared, this episode is going to be a continuation of the same study that we talked about in that first episode. So I would recommend going back and listening to that one first. Um, but Jared, before we start, um, for those that haven't listened to that first episode with you, would you mind giving a um, brief introduction to the study and kind of what we talked about last time and then kind of what we're going to talk about this time with the different results? Yes, uh, of course. So the way this study was set up is we were looking for differences in prolapse and non-prolapse styles. And in the last study, we talked about how I looked at minerals and, and the differences in minerals and TNF alpha and inflammatory cytokine. And in this this uh, this part of the podcast, we're going to talk about collagen and hormones and how previous litter um, performance may influence the incidence of prolapse occurring. So you, yeah, I think that's a good idea looking at the um, lactation performance as well as on um, the collagen because collagen is something I haven't really seen too much uh, data on in terms of swine studies. So um, I, I'm really interested to hear some about that. So what exactly did you guys see in terms of those expression levels and the lactation performance as well? So, you know, there is not a whole lot about collagen, um, especially in, in pigs and stuff. Um, this actually came from a, a sheep study that they looked at prolapse. Um, but what we looked at was collagen type 1. It's the most abundant collagen in the body. And what we were looking to see is, is there any differences in collagen? Because we know it's part of the connective tissues and support. So what we ended up finding was there is a difference. Those cells of prolapse had lower collagen type 1. And with that, there's some inhibitors and proteases that, that we, we looked at also. Um, MMP1, which breaks down collagen. And what we found was that tended to be higher in those prolapse females. So that makes sense. We have lower prolapse and it's getting broke down. So this could be a potential cause of, of prolapse. But also I looked at TIMP1, and that's the inhibitor of MMP1. And what we found there was... TIMP1 is lower in these prolapse cells, so we're not inhibiting that breakdown of collagen. And ultimately, you know, if, if that collagen is not there or it's at a lower level, we don't have that strength and connect and in the connective tissue um, that's required to hold everything in place. Um, we also also looked at hormones, uh, estradiol, relaxin. They influence collagen, and uh, what we found there was there was no differences between relaxin and, and estradiol. Um, but that's something that that's Interesting because there's a lot of work in human nutrition that says that estrogen does influence collagen, and so does relaxin. Um, with that, I also looked at, at the last litter performance of these sows, comparing the prolapse and non-prolapse sows. And what we found was was lactation days, on average, was two days longer for those sows that prolapse compared to the sows that did not prolapse. And they tended to have a higher number of stillborns compared to the non-prolapse sows. So when we tie all that together... You take the mineral aspect of it, the inflammatory cytokines, the collagen and hormones, all those things directly relate to collagen. And as we know, prolapse is multifactorial. So the goal of this study was what information could we get from bleeding prolapse and non-prolapse sows to give us a better understanding of this multifactorial issue of why we're seeing this prolapse. And, and I feel that we've gained a lot of, of knowledge in this, this pilot study that we have here but there's way more to to gain on that. And I, I think this collagen is something we really need to, to pay attention to because not only does it relate to connective tissue strength and, and relate to this prolapse issue, but it also could shed some light on, on issues such as lameness, you know, another big issue that we have with mortality. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, there's a lot to learn here with lactation days, the minerals, how they all interact and influence collagen, along with inflammatory cytokines, all this information, you know, starts to make sense because as we know it is multifactorial, we gained a lot of different factors that influence collagen. And I think this is this is a great spot for for our industry and for us to build off of. So with looking at collagen what, how would you then dig deeper into looking at the collagen expression? Is there other genes you can then um, look at to kind of measure that connective tissue strength? Yes, there is. Um, so when we talk about collagen, there's five main types of collagen that, that are often looked at in, in other species. And ty collagen type 1 being the most abundant in the body, that's where we started to see is there truly a difference in collagen. 
And now with that, um, in, in another study that's ongoing, we're going to look at collagen type 3, and there's a relationship there between collagen type 1 and type 3 that go back to strength of that connective tissue. Um, and when those ratios get out of whack and, you know, one is higher than the other, we tend to see, and humans at least, that the prolapse instance is higher. So when that type 3 drive is, is a lot higher than type 1, there's more incidence of prolapse in, in human species. And, and that's potentially something that we could see here, um, but without the research being done and no available data out there looking at, at, at swine, that's something that, I, that we're going to dig into with this next study and see, you know, is there a difference there? And likewise, you know, what's the rate of collagen turnover? Because you have collagen synthesis and degradation and all that comes together um, and that collagen turnover is very key and important to figuring out you know, what's truly going on in that connective tissue and, and how is that collagen influencing prolapse. Gotcha. Also, because you mentioned um, that they have the increased uh, lactation days for those prolapse sows. So since the sow tends to prioritize the needs of the litter over her own body typically during lactation and um, with metabolizing uh, their own resources, and the prolapse sows have those increased lactation days, do you think that can add to the bodily stress that can then cause um, more of that increased mobilization that could potentially trigger the prolapse to occur? So certainly I do think that the last litter has an effect on, on prolapse. Um, when we talked about the minerals here earlier um, in, the, in the last episode, there are some deficiencies there that are key in collagen. And if that sows you know, extraordinary is moving those nutrients to the previous litter. You think four to five, four to seven days after she's weaned, she goes back and is bred and she's starting to develop another litter and they require nutrients and, and not quite a good, a large amount of nutrients. So I certainly think that that could be a possible trigger of why we're seeing these prolapse. You know, it starts in the last litter and we don't actually see her prolapse until she gets to a point where, you know, they can't produce enough collagen and that collagen gets so weak that you know, the added mechanical stress and load on that collagen and eventually just gives way. And, and that's the result of it is prolapse. Gotcha. Well, that is all super interesting research. And I love talking about those, those pilot studies that are kind of like just the tip of the iceberg and you're just starting to dig into the good stuff. So I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, sharing all that info with us. Yeah, certainly. Thank you for having me. Yep. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swinenit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.